Being with your change log is provided by Fastly. Learn more at Fastly.com. We move fast and fix things here at ChangeLog because of Rollbar. Check them out at Rollbar.com. And we're hosted on Linode Cloud Servers. Head to Linode.com slash ChangeLog. This episode is brought to you by Rollbar. Rollbar is real-time error monitoring, alerting, and analytics that helps you resolve production errors in minutes. And I talked with Paul Bigger, the founder of Circle CI, a trusted customer of Rollbar, and Paul says they don't deploy a service without installing Rollbar first. It's that crucial to them. We operate at serious scale, and literally the first thing we do when we create a new service is is we install Rollbar in it. Like we, we need to have that visibility, uh, and without that visibility, it would be impossible to run at the scale we do and certainly with the number of people that we have. We're a relatively small team operating a major service and without the visibility that Rollbar gives us into our exceptions, it just it just wouldn't be possible. All right, if you want to follow in Paul's footsteps and start deploying with confidence today, head to rollbar.com slash changelog. Once again, rollbar.com slash changelog. What is really hood with you? You know who it is, Mix a lot. JS Party is the greatest JavaScript podcast on planet Earth. There ain't no party like a JS Party and a JS Party don't stop because when you hear them epic beats, y'all better take your seat. JS Party, it's in the building. Hello and welcome to another adventure with JS Party. I'm Nick Nisi and I am so happy to be here today, hoi hoi, and I want to introduce my fantastic panel with me today. Uh, First, we'll start with Divya. Divya, welcome. Hello, happy to be here. Then we have K-Ball. Hey, hey, to go with your hoi hoi. (laughs) (laughs) And Michael, welcome. hey We should create distinctive like (laughs) sounds for each of us. Was that part of the agreement that I missed? Like we all had to have distinct... (laughs) Yes. Oh, you didn't get your you code name and, and your, your distinctive <laughs> yell? Oh. <laughs> so, somebody messed up yeah. onboarding you. <laughs> I know, clearly. <laughs> Do you want to make up one right now? It's fine. I'll think about it. I'll think about all it. All right. Well, today we are talking about all things ES modules and where that is, what's going on with that. There's been some recent news and we've got our resident expert, Michael Rogers, here to uh, walk us through it, tell us what it is. So maybe we can start off uh, because we're, we're kind of discussing on the pre-call a little bit how we're really not experts besides you, Michael, in this. And so let's start off and get us all on the same footing with what is actually ES modules? What does that mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, um, let's go back a little bit. So they wrote a spec. <laughs> uh, T39 <laughs> wrote a spec for modules uh, a long time ago, like before they had their new staging process. And as a result, it was ratified a little bit too early, to be honest. But the goal was to put a module system in the browser. So, you know, you got a module system in Node. Wouldn't it be cool if you had a module system that was native in the browser? And the browser has like a very unique set of constraints compared to something like Node. And so the standard was really written around those constraints. And this is kind of an important thing that Node already had uh, yeah. modules. Yes, right? yes, yes. So th- this is coming after that. Yes, yes. I mean, if you want to go all the way back to ES4, I think that they had considered it a little bit, um, but it was very different and stuff. And like they came back to it after Node kind of had an ecosystem. And when they started working on it, Node's ecosystem was not what it is now. But by the time that they finished, it was something that they probably should have considered just a little bit more. There were some really tiny corners of incompatibility that were tough to work through. But anyway, years before it even it shows up in browsers, right? It shows up in Webpack and compilers. And so the syntax for ESM is something that people have been using for a long time. Like everybody uses React from, I think, day one. React used like import syntax, right? And just ran that through a compiler. Um, The thing is like that syntax change is probably not worth taking a giant ecosystem break, (laughs) right? Like it's it's sort of, it's just different from the other syntax. Um, If you're running through a compiler, there's really not a very big functional difference between the two syntaxes and what they output. The, The main reason to have ESM is so that we can have a module system in the browser and then hopefully put that module system also in Node. And then at the end of the day, maybe we can have modules that work in the browser and in Node and maybe even in future platforms without a compiler. And it's actually very important to move past compilers. There's a lot of problems and corners that compilers paint us into that we won't get out of until we can you know, do something that is not 
you know, bundling everything into one file asset. So yeah, everybody thinks they're using ESM, but they're really not. Uh, and in fact, almost nobody's using ESM, I found out, in browsers in particular. Like, there's just not a lot of people that have written this. Because, I mean, think about it, right? You can't use any node modules, can't use any browser modules that require a compiler. <laughs> um, like, there's, you know, you're, you're really kind of on your own. So there's not a, a ton of people right now using uh, native ESM. But uh, I think that the goal now um, for a lot of people sort of around the JavaScript standards and around the sort of node ecosystem is to move in a direction of these universal modules that we can run everywhere without a compiler. That does make for kind of an interesting question around what is the migration path, right? If we're already using a compiler, either because we wanted the ZSM module like, or just because you know, maybe we're writing TypeScript or we're writing JSX or we're writing something else that requires transpilation of some sort. One, what are the benefits to migrate towards a more pure ESM approach rather than transpiling down to common JS? And two, like what's the incentive for folks? Like, what's the path to get there? There's a couple things with that, right? It's not about moving entirely past compilers. It's really about having the output of a potential compiler run everywhere. So not bundling all of the code together and targeting an environment for the final compilation, right? So st still using TypeScript, but your TypeScript files turning into native ESM module files that then are loaded one by one in a file, mm -hmm. not in a big bundle. Right, um, so you you can imagine building up some tools that can migrate not all of the npm ecosystem and everything we built, but certainly parts of it. It's certainly you know possible. And working some of the DSLs and things like TypeScript into that equation isn't going to be too difficult. I think that the harder thing is that you know everything that touches Node.js standard library, for instance, everything that touches browser APIs that aren't available in Node. Those are things that we can't make work in both places in one source file, right? So we actually, we need to create some, some more abstract, like a, probably it's something that looks like a new standard library that can mount on top of all of these systems so that um, your, your final targets just use that kind of built-in system. That makes sense. So when we say that ESM is no longer experimental, it's live, that means we can sort of start using it, but a lot of the infrastructure that's gonna be needed to, to start using this at scale is not there yet. Oh, correct. Yeah, yeah. No, it's very early. I mean, it, it's, it's really hard to sort of unwind people's heads because they're like, they've been using the syntax for five years. What do you mean it's, it's new, <laughs> right? right. <laughs> but, I, you know, really, like building an ecosystem and starting to build real applications using only ESM mm -hmm. natively is, is really something very new. And we are talking about rewriting huge portions of the ecosystem and, and getting rid of a lot of tooling. Yeah. A couple things about the constraints in the browser. So you end up having this one-to-one -one match between a string that you import and a file URL. So you can use these things called import maps to, to create sort of namespaces and things like that so that you can do fancy stuff with those names. But at the end of the day, that name has to just translate into a single file URL. Um, and this is a really important distinction because Node does not do that. <laughs> like Node takes a raw name, it looks at different file extensions, it, it works its way up the, the tree in order to figure out what thing to load. Mm -hmm. um, all of that kind of dynamic loading, and we solve a lot of really important problems for ecosystem building in that dynamic algorithm, mm -hmm. um, that's gone. So we like can't use that anymore. We have to figure out how to solve all of those problems in a different way. Um, everything that you do in package.json mm -hmm. right now, anything that you put in package.json that you rely on, that changes sort of how the source file is interpreted or loaded, that doesn't work anymore. You can't have out of band information either. So there's just, you know, a lot of problems that we figured out how to solve with compilers that when we move them into this other space, we have to find different tools and different approaches to solving them. Can we break down one example of that? So, you know, we're talking about automatic finding of different things. So like this is, for example, mm -hmm. like requiring something that lives in a package that I've NPM installed or something mm -hmm. like that. There's some magic that yes, happens yes. for finding. <laughs> right, uh, right, right. So that's part of what's going away. Is are there other things in that uh, chain that I'm I'm not thinking of, or is that the main one? So that that's the main one, but you have to think of all the different problems that get solved there because it's not just one thing, right? Like one thing is that um, you know it looks at different file extensions. So you know if you in install something that will mm -hmm. automatically transpile TypeScript, it'll check for TS files and JS files, right? Like that's that's a nice feature. Uh, <laughs> um, so you can't do dynamic loading. So you got to figure out how to like you know front load all of the work that you would have done before that. The really important thing, that the thing that NPM does maybe better than any other package manager in the world, is that if two people rely on a package, 
and they publish at different times and so they need different versions of it because it changes. They do an import of just that bare string and they get the right version that they needed. And you can have these two things existing in the same namespace. So that, that string require that you do in Node um, does not map to that file. It maps to the version of the file that you put in some other metadata. And, and that, is, that is not a global, right? Like that is not mm -hmm. a global registry inside of the, the system. In Python and Ruby and most programming languages, that is just a, a global system. Um, and if two packages mm -hmm. that you're trying to require needed two different versions, you've got to figure out how to resolve that manually, um, maybe by updating it. And so this is why NPM has such an amazing ecosystem and, and these really big dependency networks because people can so freely rely on other people's code without worrying about having to manually resolve coordination mm -hmm. issues. That needs another way to solve that problem because now we can't solve that with the dynamic loader. And we can't hook code into the browser to do this either. I mean, like these constraints in the browser are there for a reason. <laughs> like you, you really can't go, oh, well, let me try like four different URLs and see what they say. And then when they come back, I'll like decide if I'm going to load something else. Like, nobody's waiting for that page to load that long. <laughs> so is that really a constraint of what we're trying to do with Node is having parity with the constraints that the browser has uh, when it comes to module loading? Sort of. I mean, I would say that Node's top priority right now is just supporting a native module system. And we can talk about custom loaders later. But they, they have code in there to figure out what to do with dynamic loading. You can actually access Node's algorithm to do mm -hmm. dynamic loading and stuff like that. So if you're mm -hmm. only solving these problems in Node, you can figure out a way to solve it probably natively because you have much more dynamic logic. But that's not going to port to the browser. So whatever you end up with if you go that route, um, you're not going to end up with, with source files that will work in both the browser and in Node. So if we want universal JavaScript, we actually have to figure out tooling that we can build on top of that Node load interface that then also just works natively in the browser. In fact, like the right thing to do really is just scale everything down to the browser constraints and find creative ways to resolve that. And then if you need to do crazy little hacks in Node, fine, <laughs> because you have a dynamic loader <laughs> that, you, that you can write code in mm -hmm. uh, that you don't have in the browser at all. The closest thing that you have in the browser is um, if you load a service worker, once that service worker is loaded, you can now take over the HTTP URLs for your domain. And so you can do really dynamic things um, for what end up being file URLs to the browser. Um, but that's kind of advanced. And, and because it's a service worker and you can't rely on it always being loaded, it's not a, a full solution. It's really sort of like a performance upgrade. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to the loader and ES modules, obviously they've been in the works for a while and behind a flag for a while. And I know that there was a couple of competing approaches to this. And so I guess I'm kind of just lost in the confusion of everything because I know at one point they were, they were talking about like changes to the package JSON or changes to the file extension to like .mjs, for example. Mm -hmm. Where has that landed? So the MJS thing was pretty controversial. It was there to solve one really specific problem. And this is actually the main thing that I was talking about when I said that they probably launched the spec a little bit early. In the browser, mm -hmm. you have this uh, script type equals module thing that you do. So there's a different looking script include when you include JavaScript that it knows is an ES module versus code that is not. ES modules are strict mode by default. Mm -hmm. So you can't just interpret the file and there's no signal when you look at the file to know how to interpret it and that it's strict mode because it, it won't have the, the strict mode practice any, anymore in it. For a lot of reasons, just detection does not work well. So you need some signal in Node that replaces that script module equals browser to say, these things are going to be ES modules. There's two ways to do that. One is that you can have a .mjs file extension that still is in Node and it works. Um, another mm -hmm. is that you can put this thing in your package.json called type equals module, and then all of the files in your package will be interpreted that way by Node natively. All of your .js files. And that's sort of like a more ideal pattern. The, pro the problem that you get into is that, man, so Webpack is very <laughs> confused by native ESM. Could we just stop it? So Webpack, <laughs> yeah. go there, right? Like the problem you run into. Yeah, yeah. Webpack has an even tougher problem to deal with, right? Because they convinced like millions of developers to write <laughs> import statements in .js files, and then they compiled them into something mm -hmm. else. And then when those are actually native, when those are native modules that use the native syntax and it actually means something different, they kind of mm -hmm. don't know how to compile that well. 
and what to do there. So trying to use native ESM is a really good way to break all your Webpack stuff, which is very <laughs> ironic because so much of the push <laughs> to yeah. finish up ESM was from people using it in Webpack <laughs> and now it's all broken. <laughs> but yeah, uh, so that's the situation. Is that a current state of Webpack situation mm-hmm. or is there, there a fundamental challenge underlying that? As far as I know, that's the situation. That is what I found. Like the current yeah. current state yeah. rather than there's something fundamental that prevents them. From right, right. Out. I mean, I had conversations with people just a few weeks ago who thought this was still a problem. I ran into it personally maybe three months ago, four months ago, something like that. So that was like the, the first time that I noticed how bad it was. Maybe somebody's working on this. Maybe they're not. The fact that, you know, ESM in Node just came out from behind a flag probably means that it didn't have the mm-hmm. highest priority on trying to resolve it. Um, I don't know what the fix is. It is a Webpack problem. It is a Webpack concern. It's going to have to be handled on their end. And I really don't envy the position that they're in because in Node, it took roughly three years to figure this out. And it took changes to the spec and it took an MJS extension. <laughs> and so it's really mm-hmm. not easy. So yeah, we'll we'll kind of see how that shakes out. Would that also be the case for Rollup? Because I know Rollup uses like polyfills for import export. I think. Yeah, probably. So is there? Yeah. So like, would it? Would theoretically? Do you know if ESM would work with Rollup as is, or is that something that needs to be fixed there as well? I, I don't know. I haven't used Rollup really. Okay. Should ask the begin folks about this. They've done a ton of stuff with uh, Rollup and, and native ESM, and they're actually using native ESM in the browser and then just using rollup mm-hmm. on the deploy. So their, their whole kind of dev environment is just natively loading the original files and then they use rollup to publish something. So they have figured out how to make this work and they have a tool chain on top of rollup to do it. So it's, it's possible. It may require like some configuration. It might not work like out of the box. I think that they've essentially figured out how to do it. But again, I think that where this becomes really tricky is where you start importing other things that are not following the same sort of standard, right? Where you're, where you're loading other NPM modules and then those have potentially like, you know, separate entry points for Node in the browser. And, you know, well, what if they're ESM? Is that, a, is that the browser entry point? Is that the Node entry point? Like, wh- how do you transpile that? And so how all these options interact is really difficult to figure out because it's not a very clean matrix, right? Like we're, we used to think of Node in the browser and now we're thinking of is a module ESM or old style? And that Mm -hmm. doesn't tell you if it belongs in either of those buckets. (laughs) And so, yeah, it's a difficult problem. There's a lot of really, you know, sort of um, odd edge cases. I would say that if you were going to try to adopt native ESM today um, and try to do something with it, it would really only be worth it if you were using it natively in the browser and you weren't trying to depend on a bunch of stuff that wasn't written that way. I don't think that it's worth it today to do that. I think that in the future, we'll probably have better tools. But if you, if you want to like, you know, play around with it today and be part of like, you know, building a new like kind of universal JavaScript ecosystem, like awesome dive in. Uh, it's totally worth it for that. But yeah, if you just want to, you know, make your React app work, but you want it to be native ESM, like you're, you're going to suffer. Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't recommend that. All right. But I imagine most like modules use common JS as is. And so if you wanted to use native ESM, you would also equally struggle, wouldn't you? Because then you would have like common JS and then you would try to use native stuff, potentially using Webpack or something else to transpile so that it works together. I don't even know how you would cobble that. People use lots of things. <laughs> that is the case. There's not a lot of stuff in NPM that uses native ESM targeted at Node. But if it was targeted at the browser, it could potentially run in Node, right? Mm-hmm. And there's really this question of like, you know, when you're transpiling some code that way, what's the intended target, you know, or what, what, what was the original intended target versus where you're trying to compile it to, because that kind of tells you how you need to get at certain things. Yeah, it's, it's tough problems, you know. A lot of people have a lot of code to write. Uh. This episode is brought to you by DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean is the simplest cloud platform for developers and teams with products like droplets, spaces, Kubernetes, load balancers, block storage, and pre-built one-click apps. 
You can deploy, manage, and scale cloud applications faster and more efficiently on DigitalOcean. Whether you're running one virtual machine or 10,000, DigitalOcean makes managing your infrastructure way too easy. Head to do.co slash changelog. Again, do.co slash changelog. All right, so we've been talking about uh, ESM and what that is, and it's uh, now available in Node without a flag. So let's let's talk a little bit about compatibility. So with, with this, you, you mentioned that there are you basically have to be explicit about what you're loading, and there's a couple of different ways to do that, either with like the MJS extension or with a type of module. I think you said in the package JSON. My question is, if I had a big project that was written like a big package in Node, could I incrementally start switching things over to ESM or would I have to kind of do it all at once? You could theoretically with the MJS file extension, right? So then you okay. could have the files yeah. live next to each other and you'd have the right signal. There are some difficulties importing between them that you would have to deal with. Is that just things like like the default export versus like the different, like a, a more of a dynamic load or a dynamic export that you might have with CommonJS? Things like that? So there are just there are features in each one that can't be ported. Yeah. So it, it gets a little tricky. I wouldn't recommend doing it a file at a time. I'd recommend doing it a module at a time. Um, okay. And and if you have a really big application, uh, I would start breaking parts off into independent modules <laughs> that are that are then uh, <laughs> just native ESM. That that would be the route that I would recommend. Mm. Yeah, it's tough. Don't move applications over yet. Just <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> It's there. I have to jump on it. In the early days of Node, <laughs> in the early days of, of Node, a lot of people came to the ecosystem specifically because there were no modules, because they wanted to be the people that wrote that first thing. And there's, all, it's really exciting to be part of that community, and it's really exciting work to do. And just like. <laughs> In general, if you are early to something and it blows up, there are really big rewards to you personally. <laughs> so just like FYI, if, if people are looking to like step up their career, like these things really do pay off in the long run. A lot of people around Node uh, did quite well. <laughs> Not me, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I know. I mean, I'm fine. I'm fine. Uh, I just, I'm, you know, I didn't have like an exit or, you know, something like that. But, uh, you know, a lot of people did. Yeah, it's just, it's really fun. Um, I'm honestly kind of, one of the things that really excites me about this is kind of getting back to that and, and going like, oh, you know what? Like nobody has figured out like how to write command line utilities that, that, you know, you could potentially port around. Or like one thing that I've been working on lately is like, how do we write tests that you could run in both Node and in the browser? And that would be really great. I'll talk a little bit later about this, this dependency management thing that I wrote, but it'd be really cool if like when I want to check if updating one of my dependencies breaks something, I can just do it in a website and in an iframe sandbox, it can run all of those tests, right? Um, and I don't, I don't have to like, you know, spin up some infrastructure to go do the test like we would with any kind of node package. You can sort of like start to break out of the platform. So th there's, there's a lot of flexibility, and a lot of things that we'll be able to do with this new system once it's built. And some of the most exciting things to build right now are at the, the sort of intersection of like the new things that you need to do and, and the gaps that don't exist yet. So kind of along those, you, so you mentioned there are some things that you can do or express in each type of module system that aren't expressible in the other. Like if you wanted to, to bridge between those, and you mentioned like do stuff as a module at a time, like what are the options available to you? I mean, one that I'm thinking of is like, I remember when I first started doing Node after years of doing the browser, I tried to set up transpiling within Node and it was like, it was pretty freaking flaky, <laughs> but um, is that how you'd go? Or like, how would you start pulling in native ESM modules as you created them into a common JS application? Carefully. So if you're only using Node's native system and you weren't using a compiler, you could do it pretty easily. You know, you, you could publish it to NPM. You could just import it like any other package by name that you just installed. That part of it should work now that ESM is out from behind the flag. What's not going to work, though, is anything that requires dynamic hooks into the module system. And you'd be surprised at how many things you rely on that do that. So any transpiling of languages at import time is all done that way. So if you use TypeScript, CoffeeScript, any kind of transpiler, 
in Node itself, you now don't have that loader to do that dynamically. And the dynamic loader interface <laughs> is like a separate sort of command line flag, and you really only get one of them. So there's a very kind of different ergonomics that, that happen around it. It's also still experimental and very buggy. Like if you do any IO in it, it just crashes. <laughs> so yeah, I found that out the hard way. Uh, I have some crazy hacks around this. But yeah, I think that if, if you're just writing JavaScript, if you're just using it in Node, it's pretty easy and, and you won't be too mad. <laughs> okay, so now that it's outside of the flag, I can import an ESM module yep. uh, into a file that is otherwise using CommonJS or other things. It's just then that would have to export. Can I require an import into the same file without using a transpiler? Yes. Okay. There are some caveats, but yes. Okay. So, so long as I'm doing you know, vanilla stuff there and I've, I can do that import in both places. So if I'm doing it module at a time, interesting. But how you import it is really specific. There are like things that you can't do if you're going between the two systems. So, and there's, there's documentation on that. I would just read through that. They've documented that quite well. Awesome. And we should probably include a link to that in the show notes. So you were talking about sort of the benefits of, or the potential benefits of getting into the trend early and build, publishing modules. Do you think the future of this is a new set of ESM focused modules or is it migrating older common JS modules to ESM? Um, I think it's mostly going to be new. It's actually quite difficult to imagine compiling a lot of what's in NPM today into a file that would run universally. That's really hard. It's possible, but it's probably pretty unlikely. You may end up with some pretty gross stuff in there. You could potentially end up with, you know, just a, a bundle as one of the dependencies. So you're not getting any of the, the other subfile and, and module deduplication, stuff like that. There's a lot of concerns that you should have about that method. Yeah. And I mean, to be honest, a lot of what we rely on is pretty garbage. <laughs> 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 and like, I, I mean, I wrote some of it, so it's okay. Like, I can say this. Uh, <laughs> um, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's really bad. Like, we, I mean, we've just been stacking layers upon layers upon layers upon layers. And, and a lot of things in our depth chains are not maintained anymore. And simple packages with just a few depths. And every time that I you know, run NPM install, it's like, you have 12 known vulnerabilities in your depth tree. And I'm like, really? <laughs> and you're like, NPM fix, audit fix. And then it's like, yeah, no, we can't. Sorry. <laughs> like, uh, this is like not great. This is not a great state of things. Another thing, too, is that I think that it would be presumptuous to assume that this whole ecosystem that we built at first without even thinking about browsers at all, and then for the next sort of five years of that, only thinking in terms of compilers, that the modules that we built in that ecosystem are just going to work easily and, and perform it in this new system. That, you know, if you're loading these as individual files in the browser, that you're going to want, you know, the exact same kind of patterns in that ecosystem. I think that e ecosystems form really organically and whatever constraints that you impose on the, that you have in the tooling or in the usage end up sort of uh, persisting into the way that people develop things into that graph. Like the, the early node ecosystem before we had a lot of transpiling before Webpack, I mean, we had Browserify, but, but it was very sort of node centric. The patterns and, and depth trees looked very different, and now they look quite different from that because of how much it's changed for a lot of the front end tooling. And I, I would just not expect to see us just like port that directly over to this new system. Uh, that that wouldn't make a ton of sense to me. And a lot of why we want to do this is so that we can get better performance than we get from bundling for most application use cases. And uh, some of the trade offs that you would probably have to make when you were migrating all of that stuff over would you know, bring you back to, you know, worse states of performance than bundling would. So that's probably going to be one of the big drives uh, over time to get people to to this is is performance potentially. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I can talk a little bit about how I, how I solve that or how I'm working on solving that, I should say. Yeah, so I, I wrote a little package manager called Reg for universal JavaScript. So it uses the, the custom loader in Node and it works sort of natively in the browser. And the way that it works is that you give it a file and it sort of parses through the whole depth tree. Uh, and it basically statically links everything. 
it basically takes each one of the files, so whether they're local files or they're files that are in the sort of package registry, and it puts this data structure around them. It's a data structure it uses a, a technique called hash trees um, or Merkle trees. It's very similar to the data structure that you have in Git, and I'll get it. In, like Git is amazing at so many things, and so there's a lot of reasons to use that data structure. But um, you end up with a, with a hash for every module essentially. And so what you do is you replace all these import statements with imports of the hashes all the way down. Um, and then, you know, you get a new root hash module for the thing that you published. And then you stick it on, you know, a name or, or whatever that you're putting, you know, or a version, tag, whatever. That sort of static linking process means that you can now have two modules rely on two different versions of the same thing because you've swapped out the name for just the sort of statically linked name. Um, it means you have a, a full immutable data structure for the entire depth tree of everything that's ever published, which is really nice. You don't, no package lock files, no extra da da da, like it's all just that by default. And the really cool thing about this is because we have that uh, statically mapped tree, we can basically, let me think about this for a second. Um, oh, HP push. So now when you ask for a module, I can go, oh, yeah, I know what that is, and I know all the depths of it, so I'm just going to push you all those files. And so we basically get a, a sort of unminified bundle version of all of those files, which is amazing. And if you use Broadly compression, you don't really need minification. Like it's, it's like in like 8% probably of a savings. But the really cool thing is that like th then you go and ask for that module again, right? Say that module is your application code. Yeah. When you go and ask for that module again, you're going to give me an e tag for the last one. And if it updated, that e tag is not for one file. It's actually for the entire package tree. So I can diff those two trees, and then I can just HTTP push you the files that changed. Um, so, when, so when you update one module and it has a depth, you just get those files and not the entire tree again. So the problem with bundle performance is that every time you load the page, you're going to get the bundle again because people are doing like daily deploys. <laughs> and so whenever you reload, like the, it's changed and so you're blowing out the cache every time. Um, so for any applications that like you load twice and update, <laughs> you will end up getting better performance out of the system. Does this also let you... like? Can you cache those modules cross domain? So here's the thing. Uh, technically, yes. Te technically, today, most browsers treat their HTTP cache as a universal cache. The caveat here is that that's going away. Browsers for, uh, they've found really clever ways to like fingerprint people. And one of them is, is by this shared HTTP cache. Like you know that if you get a resource back reasonably fast, that they already had it. And so if, you know, the New York Times is the only place still relying on some old module, then you can just go like, oh, let me see how long it takes to load that module. And then I know if you went to the New York Times. And so there's like a tracking vector here. There's some, some other fingerprinting vectors. It's bad. So browsers are, are by and large, I think, moving towards a model now where the HTTP cache is no longer shared between domains. So the HTTP cache for your application, even of other domains, is just going to be scoped to your application because we can't have nice things. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I can see all of the reasons there, and it just makes me sad. I know, I know, it's really it's really bad. Yeah, if we could figure out how to fix that, we could go back to uh, the system that we had before. You know, this is why everybody uses that CDN version of jQuery because everybody already has it in their cache, right? <laughs> and and uh, yeah, we could have had something very similar to that, but um, unfortunately, that's that's probably going away. We shouldn't rely on that. That actually raises so that's. If you use CDNs, that you're not going to have that shared. It's still going to be yeah, yeah, yeah. across the domain of the web page rather yep. than the CDN. Yep. Oh my gosh! Yep. yep. Sorry. Uh. <laughs> Sorry to break it to you. <sighs> yeah. That fingerprinting is pretty clever, but also completely disgusting. Oh yeah, yeah. Advertisers are very clever. Um, <laughs> it's true. Another really cool thing that I can do, t talking about sort of deduplication. So this still deduplicates between, say you dynamically load a module later, right? You're still going to have great cache between, you know, all these modules for any of the sub-dependencies. That's going to work really well. Another thing that I do, though, is that, so I I'm using these data structures that I built for the next generation version of IPFS. It's called Unix v 2 So th these are data structures to represent a file and directories, but we're not using the directories in reg because in reg, a package is a file and has a one-to-one -one relationship with just a file because that's how the browser thinks of it. So it's better that we think about it that way. But this other thing that I'm doing is that um, I'm actually chunking up the file and then referring to the, like the, the hash of the file is actually then like an array of all the parts um, and the hashes of those parts. 
So there's this algorithm called Rabin that uh, rsync developed like forever ago. So rsync has used this for a very, very long time. And what it does is it, it gives you really consistent block boundaries. So it, it uses sort of this rotating hash fingerprint over the file to give you really consistent boundaries even between changes of the file. So what that means is that when you change part of a file, you're only going to change that one block and you're not going to then like push all the offsets in every, every block after that like you would if you just sort of chunked it up by a, a, like some integer, right? Some max size. This is really cool because in Node and potentially in the browser with service workers, we actually get sub-file data deduplication. So um, as you're sort of pulling down files locally, Reg keeps just a local cache on your system. And as new versions of that package come out, you're literally just pulling like the bytes and the blocks that changed. You're not even pulling down the whole files that changed anymore. So it's just like this incredibly efficient um, sync and caching uh, protocol for everything. And is that all set up just as soon as you load uh, a package that's using Reg? Is that what's setting it up in the browser? The browser can't really use that because it has to think that things is just file URLs. Like in a service worker, I could take over that URL space and then like have the data structures locally. And the way that the registry works is that the registry just serves you all of these files by hash and it'll give you the metadata or the file data, potentially depending on the API that you hit for every package as well. Um, but what you do in Node is that you actually like parse through that whole tree go, oh, what parts of this do I not have yet? And then it goes and pulls down the, the underlying block data from the registry and then just materializes the files that you need. Eventually, as you need them, like I want to do this really dynamically as you need it eventually, but because there's this bug in the loader right now where I can't do any IO, there's actually a step before your code runs where I materialize all the files <laughs> so that I don't then have to do a new IO um, in the loader itself. But yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's really cool. There's some really cool stuff. I ended up chatting with Brian LaRue for a while, who's doing this, this big serverless thing. And he made the point that, you know, we have like maybe like a half dozen HTTP APIs now. So, I mean, in the browser, you've got the service worker API for doing HTTP servers. You've got the Lambda API, which is like just his own weird thing. You have Node.js's API. You probably have like a new style Node.js API at some point. Mapping something to work on top of all of these is actually really difficult. Like nobody's written like just a, a nice standard that, that you could port on top of all of these. But if we define such a standard, you know, just like here's, you know, write a function like this that takes this request and this response object. This is what they look like. And we'll create those and interact with them proper. And you return or, or like a, maybe it's just a request and then you return, you know, some kind of response object, right? Figure out what the signature needs to look like. And then we can map that on top of all these systems. And then if anybody publishes anything into this package registry, he can have a service in Lambda or a service in Cloudflare Workers or wherever where you just give it any hash that's in the registry and it'll run that function. And you know he can have like his users with different accounts for, for the actual compute costs of that and all of the sort of uh, pricing and tallying. But you know they don't have to worry about like actually deploying any of that stuff ever. <laughs> um, it's all just there kind of just in time. <laughs> and there you don't have the advertiser mess. Yeah, yes, exactly, exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, and then... I don't think that I can talk about it, but like, I can't talk about specifics, but like, if there was theoretically a way to share a directory or some kind of shared resource across a bunch of different Lambda functions, the cache for all of them could just be in the same thing and be really localized. So yeah, I mean, th there's a reason that like CDNs use hashes for everything. <laughs> and these, these data structures uh, work really, really nicely with LRU-based caches because each data structure sort of roots as its own hash. And then any of the common pieces in that data structure that don't change that continue to get access will stay in even if the, the root changes and, and things change over time and they need to fall out of the cache. So there's just a lot of things in general about these data structures that are, that are quite nice that I've been working on for a while now. And this is like kind of the, the first application that I'm really putting it through. So. Got it. So this is for, you're doing this native registry for ESM yep. modules. Yep. So. It's up now. It's, it's and in Cloudflare workers. So it's pretty fast. <laughs> Don't uh, put too much data in it or else you'll, you'll mess up my account. <laughs> I might have to shut it down. <laughs> How, if at all, does this interact with other registries like NPM? Oh, it doesn't at all. No, um, there's no compatibility. If there is any compatibility at some point, it, it'll end up being some way to take packages out of NPM and compile them to Reg. Um, and, and potentially even, you know, maybe somebody puts up a namespace where you just, just in time kind of materialize those assets and, and move them over. But when you're thinking about what a package is in NPM, uh, how it's referenced and how it is loaded, there's not really a way to do direct compatibility in that direction. 
you could pretty easily take a reg package and just like push it into NPM. That would be pretty trivial. But because you can't do the dynamic loading, you can't reason about things the same way. And you, yeah, you can't really port them over very well. You, you, you really end up just kind of compiling it into something else. But you know, NPM doesn't work natively in the browser. So <laughs> it's like, you gotta kind of pick one. <laughs> This episode is brought to you by Brave. Big news from the Brave team, version 1.0 is official. That means our favorite open source, privacy focused, blazing fast browser is ready for prime time. Their brand new iOS app landed just in time for the announcement and the Brave team is celebrating by granting 8 million basic attention tokens to the community. That means when you download the iOS app, you get 20 bat absolutely free Put it to good use by heading to changelog.com, hitting the triangle icon in the upper right hand corner and flipping us a tip. All right. Well, that was quite a deep dive into modules. Uh, and the biggest takeaway I got is don't use them yet. <laughs> so that that's great. I will continue to to do what I'm doing and do it well, uh, which is not use them right now, uh, other than you know through the the approximation that I'm using through TypeScript right now, uh, and I'll continue to be happy with that. Uh, so thank you for that, Michael. That was really awesome. Uh, now let's talk about one of our recurring segments, which is I'm excited about X, where X can be literally anything. And Cable, do you want to start us off? Sure. I am excited about CSS subgrid, which just shipped in the latest version of Firefox, Firefox 71. And this is the level two part of the CSS grid layout specification. So this allows us to nest grids within one another, which solves some really tricky problems with getting nested grid items lining up with your original grid. So previously, it was pretty hard to, for example, have isolated components that used grid and put them correctly inside layouts or other components that use grid. And CSS grid makes that straightforward and helps in a ton of different ways. So I'm super, super excited about that. Um, it just launched. It's only available in Firefox. So once again, don't use this for real yet because it will break in the majority of browsers that are not Firefox. Um, you know, I think we're at 60 or 70% of people using Chrome. Super on brand for this one. <laughs> <laughs> but it's coming uh, and it's real and you can play with it for real in Firefox 71, which just shipped. So go. Very cool. That is something I will definitely check out and continue to not use, but check it out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Divya, you want to go next? Yeah, sure. So um, I'm really excited about the Web Almanac. It was officially released at Chrome Dev Summit this year, which is 2019. <laughs> and um, Rick Viscomi worked on it. And there's a lot of like contributions to the Web Almanac. It's really neat because it's essentially just a whole plethora of knowledge of various web related things. And it takes in a lot of um, expert information on specific things. So like performance as well as JavaScript and CSS and various other pieces that you might not fully understand or like have the full, yeah, just have the full understanding of that piece. And so it gives you a really high level concept of what that is from like a web perspective. And then there's also some data associated with like, for example, the JavaScript one talks about general like JavaScript bytes per page, like the average amounts and like what that means from a performance standpoint and and things like that, which I think oftentimes as developers, you hear a lot of numbers thrown at you. You're like, oh, this is whatever kilobytes of data. And you're like, okay, I don't understand what that means. Um, and the almanac breaks down like key figures that you as a developer should know or what is useful for you to know. Um, and that's really cool. So I'm excited about that. It's very well done as well. So another thing that I did, I actually did this quite a while ago. I started pulling all of the data. I think I may have talked about this on a prior one, but I started pulling all the GitHub Archive data and filtering it and getting a lot of sort of daily metrics out of it. And for a, a while now, I've just been creating a markdown file every day in this repo using GitHub Actions and sending myself an email. And so this has been really cool. Like I, I, I've started to learn a lot about sort of what is trending on GitHub and projects that I wouldn't have seen otherwise and, and different stuff that's going on and which projects are active and which ones aren't. And so now I opened up that, that email list, so now you can subscribe to it. 
So you can you can find the link at github.com slash M-I-K-E-A-L. My name spelled fucked up. Uh, slash daily. Also, there'll probably be a link in the show notes. It actually turned me onto this project that I just never would have seen called Post Woman that is like, it's really popular. Like it, it's like sustained stars like for weeks now. Um, and it's, it's this API request builder that was built in Vue.js and it's really phenomenal. Like it's, it's a really, really nice project, but yeah. It, and I just, I never would have seen this if it wasn't for um, looking like just kind of sitting in this data for a while now. And yeah, so that, that was what I kind of wanted to bring up. Super cool project. Check it out. Where was that email list again? Like it's on your page. There's a link in the repo, um, like the, the actual, you know how you can say like, here's my website. The website is actually just a link to go sign up for the email <laughs> list. Um, but we'll also put the link directly ah, in the show okay. notes, I imagine too. So, Yep. Yes, I think that would be yeah, good. We'll put it in the show notes. And congratulations, you have That's broken mm-hmm. the trend. Uh, I have used Postwoman and it's great. Oh, yeah, so yeah. There's something I, I have used and will continue to use instead of not use. <laughs> <laughs> So cool. Cool. And uh, I'll go next. And um, to round it off, the, the thing that I'm excited about uh, is <laughs> it's a terminal emulator called Kitty. Its tagline is it's a fast, featureful GPU-based terminal emulator. And I have been a long time iTerm2 user, but this quickly got me going. I really like it a lot. And it's just so fast. Like, you would think that I wouldn't complain too much about a terminal being slow, but... Whew, it can be quite slow. And especially if you're trying to use something like ligatures in iTerm, that turns off the GPU render uh, in iTerm. So it's pretty slow, but Kitty takes care of that. So you can have ligatures if you want them and it's still really snappy. Uh, so you can get that from Homebrew uh, for not just Mac, but uh, Linux as well. And maybe some kind of WSL windows or something, but uh, yeah, check it out. Kitty. We'll have a link to that in the show notes. Yeah. I, I did not realize how slow the terminals that I was using were until I started using the blink terminal on iPad pro. And I was like, this is so fast. <laughs> like, right? What is yeah. going on? Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> blink. Blink is pretty fantastic. Yeah. Without it, I, I just feel like I'm running like my editor in Electron or something. <laughs> yeah. <Ooh. laughs> Well, that does it for our show today. Thank you uh, to all of the wonderful panelists for, for talking modules, talking about awesome things that you're excited about, and we will see you next week. Cheers. All right. Thank you for tuning in to JS Party this week. Tune in live on Thursdays at 1 p.m. U.S. Eastern at changelaw.com slash live. Join the community and Slack with us in real time during the shows. Head to changelaw.com slash community. And do us a favor. Share this show with a friend. We just have a podcast. Go into Overcast and favorite it. And thank you to Fastly, our bandwidth partner. Head to Fastly.com to learn more. And we move fast to fix things right here at ChangeLaw because of Rollbar. Check them out at Rollbar.com. We're hosted on Leno Cloud Servers. Head to Leno.com slash ChangeLaw. Check them out and support this show. Our music is produced by Breakmaster Cylinder. And you can find more shows just like this at changelaw.com. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next week. Thank you.